Hallelujah. Well, I believe whenever you have a guest speaker, just get him right on up. You didn't come to hear me. You came to hear Dr. Seville tonight. Um, it is a great, tremendous honor for tonight for my wife and I personally to host Dr. Seville. Dr. Seville needs no introduction in the body of Christ, unless you've been living under a rock for the last 50 years. He needs no introduction. He's worked uh, with Brother Copeland for many, many years in ministry. He has, uh, his, his, the people that have spoken in his life, think about this. I'm just talking to, about this in the back room. He said under Brother Hagen, Brother Copeland, uh, he said under T.L. Osborne and Oral Roberts. Wow, what a, what, a, uh, what a team to speak into your life. And uh, so we're so honored that he's here tonight. I have uh, mentioned to the congregation, Dr. Seville, that uh, when Dr. Dufresne, I mean, uh, Dr. Dufresne went to heaven, uh, he was my spiritual father. Of course, Brother Hagen was before that. But um, then when he went to heaven, the Lord spoke to him because I said, Lord, who do I connect up with? And the Lord said, I'm going to bring four men into your life. And Dr. Seville was one of them. Praise God. It's a tremendous honor to have you here because I believe this is a divine thing. I wouldn't have known that God was going to do that, but I'm so thankful. So um, he really doesn't need any introduction. You know, the Bible says that, uh, that those gifts that are in the ones he puts in the body of Christ, the fivefold ministry offices, those gifts, are, if they are honored properly, we will get the most out of them. Hallelujah. I mean, not only did God gift and grace Dr. Seville, he put men with great anointings and giftings all around him his entire life, and he has been faithful to sit under them and receive from them. So you're receiving Dr. D uh, Dr. Seville tonight, but you're receiving everything those men sowed into his life. I mean, what can you get out of this meeting tonight? <laughs> Amen. I know he doesn't want any attention drawn to him as a man, but we do. The Bible says, Paul said, I magnify my office. And so we magnify the greatness of God. I'm not talking about a man. I'm talking about the God in the man. That We honor that and we receive all that God has in that gifting and in that office tonight. Amen. Amen. So thank you for coming to Iowa. Such an honor to have you. If I could have my usher come, bring the podium down. Would you stand with me and give Dr. Savelle a great, big, huge Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, praise God. Thank you. I made to get they need to get back on the platform. They can't see me. <laughs> there are some disadvantages of being short, but at least I'm handsome. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. What a joy and an honor it is to be with you. And well, what a beautiful church. Been looking forward to being here. And I'm honored, Pastor, that uh, God has said to you that I'm one of the men that he would send into your life. I'm honored by that. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to come and impart into your lives tonight. Amen. How many of you absolutely are passionate about the Word of God? Yeah. Boy, I am. I can't get enough of it. Absolutely can't get enough of it. I just entered in February my 53rd year in the ministry. And I have had the privilege of preaching in 49 different nations. My television broadcast is seen in over 200 nations around the world. And uh, I just turned 75 on Christmas Eve. My wife and I have been married 55 and a half years. I have two daughters, seven grandchildren, and one great-granddaughter. Hallelujah. Amen. And not only that, but... I happen to be God's favorite child. Praise God. <laughs> and you do come a close second. I didn't want to leave you out. Praise God. That's the way I feel. He's been so good to me all of my life. In fact, when 1969, <clears throat> I was um, still running from God. I heard the call of God watching Oral Roberts on television in my grandmother's home in Oklahoma City in 1957. I was just about to turn 11 years old. And uh, it was Thanksgiving, a family reunion there at my grandmother's home. 
And somebody turned on her old black and white field code television set. And when it finally came on, you remember they didn't come on immediately. And when it finally came on, uh, Oral Roberts was the first image that I saw. And he's preaching under the big tent. And his sermon that day was one of his most famous sermons called The Fourth Man. I was captivated by it. And uh, I'd never heard of Oral Roberts. Now, my mother's folks were all raised in Oklahoma, so most of my relatives had heard of him. Some of them were even partners with his ministry, I learned later. And then some of them, they didn't like him at all. And while he was praying for the sick and people are having miracles, <clears throat> some of my uncles that I remember, they said, ah, oh, he's a fake. He paid those people to get out of those wheelchairs and all that. But even as an 11-year-old boy, I knew it was real. I knew it was real. And then I heard, not audibly, but it, it spoke so loud to me on the inside, I thought it was audible. And I heard him say, someday you'll preach like that. Someday you'll pray for people like that. And um, I, I thought it was one of my cousins who were standing on either side of me. When I turned to ask them, what did you say? They were both gone. And I was standing there alone. And I thought, man, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> I, I, I'd already determined what I was going to do at nine years old. My dad was in the automotive business. And uh, in 1953, uh, General Motors Chevrolet Division uh, created their sports car called the Corvette. And my dad became a Corvette specialist. He was trained by General Motors to work on Corvettes. Uh, they were fiberglass. Not many body men knew how to work fiberglass back in those days. So my dad became a Corvette specialist. And uh, not only that, but my dad raced automobiles. I grew up on racetracks. My dad restored classic automobiles. He built hot rods. Everything my dad did is what I loved. I, I, th I think I was born with it. Some people acquire it over a period of time, you know, but I was born with it. And, uh, and so I, I wanted my dad to teach me everything he knew. And I, I would say, as a young boy, starting at nine years old, you remember when families used to have breakfast together? <laughs> and uh, before dad would go to work, before my daughter, uh, my sister and I would go to school, uh, the family would sit at the breakfast table and dad would not get up from the table until he'd hear me say this. And I'd say, dad, when I grow up, we're gonna own our own automotive business. It's gonna have a big sign out front, Savelle and dad. Because it's always, you know, surveillance, I mean, uh, father and son, you know. And he'd get a kick out of that, and then he'd get up and go to work, you know. So that's what I wanted to do. And God was fouling up my plans with this preaching business. <clears throat> so I thought to myself, if I never tell anybody about this experience, then I won't have to do it. And so I never told anybody. Didn't tell my mother or dad. Didn't tell anybody. And... Uh, and then by the time I was 21 years old, I was living my dream. I owned my own automotive business. I was doing paint and body work. I was restoring classic cars. I was building hot rods and race cars and hauling race cars all over the southern part of the United States with my dad, living my dream. But I had married a Pentecostal girl. And she told me the night before our wedding. Now, I, I never heard of Pentecostal. I didn't know what a Pentecostal was. And she told me the night before our wedding, she said, Jerry, I made a vow to God when I got filled with the Holy Spirit at eight years old that the man I marry will be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, preach the gospel, and go to Africa. I said, Carolyn, you're marrying the wrong man. I'm not doing any of that. She said, oh, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. I'm doing what I want to do, and I like doing what I want to do, and, and I'm, I'm not going to do any of that. And she said, you don't know the power of intercessory prayer. I said, no, I guess not. In fact, I've never even heard of it. What's intercessory prayer? She said, don't, don't bother with it. All you got to do is go in there tomorrow night, 
When the preacher says to you, take this woman, you say, I do, and me and God will take care of the rest. <laughs> Amen. Well, I knew I loved her, and I knew I wanted to marry her. And I thought, well, you know, I can, I can change her. <laughs> so I told her, I said, now, I just want you to know, I'm not doing any of that. If you marry me, you're going to spend the rest of your life on racetracks. I'm going to race cars. And that's when she said, you don't know the power of intercessory prayer. So for the next three years of our marriage, I was living my dream. Now, Carolyn, she went to church nearly every day of her life. I think the woman had her own key to the place because <laughs> she practically lived there. And she had the whole church praying for me, all the time praying for me. Some of them would wreck their cars on purpose and bring them to my shop just so they could witness to me. <laughs> there, there was a lady, her, she and her husband were from Ireland, and her name was Mabel McGee. And uh, I, I had known her husband, uh, I grew up playing baseball, and, and he sponsored one of the teams that I played for when I was younger. And I knew him, but I'd never met her. And I didn't know that they went to the same church that Carolyn grew up in. I didn't know he was Pentecostal, you know. But anyway, Mabel, she was a sweet, sweet lady. But that woman wrecked her car about every other month. <clears throat> and she wouldn't have anybody to repair it but me. And she'd bring it to my shop and somebody would take her home after, you know, after she delivered it. And I'd raise the trunk and there were tracks laying in the trunk, open to Romans chapter 10, you know. <laughs> or there'd be a Bible laying on the dash, Romans chapter 10, highlighted, you know. <clears throat> and so I asked her the last time I repaired her car, I said, Mabel, do you wreck your car on purpose just so you can preach to me? And she just smiled, never did say nay, yeah, yeah, or nay, you know. And so, uh, <clears throat> not only that, but, but Carolyn was very involved in the youth department, you know, and, and uh, she always went to, to camp with them and uh, uh, helped in the summer camps and all that. And so, one year, the, well, uh, latter part of 1968, she had the entire youth department fasting for me. They like to starve to death. <laughs> I didn't know any of that was going on. And, uh, and then when I'd come home at night from being out on a racetrack somewhere, you know, and getting back home two o'clock in the morning or something, and I'd be tired and worn out, and all I wanted to do is go to bed, go to sleep. And then this little hand would put a, come over on my chest. And she'd start praying in that language. <laughs> I didn't know what she's saying. I'd take her little hand, put it back on her side of the bed. <laughs> and then in a little while, that hand would come back on my chest. And then she'd pray in English. Lord, don't have, let him have any more fun till he surrenders his life to you. I'd take her little hand and put it back over there. I said, Carolyn, quit praying that. I'm having fun. She said, no, you're not. You just think you are. She said, when you get to serving God, then you'll have real fun. And, and I didn't know what that meant. But anyway, it took Kenneth Copeland coming to Shreveport, Louisiana in 1969 <clears throat> and preaching the Bible, the word of faith, like I had never heard in my life. And I couldn't run anymore. I didn't go forward that night. It was his last night there. I didn't go forward that night, but when I got home, I couldn't, I couldn't go to sleep. And at three o'clock in the morning, I got up, went in my living room. I said, Lord, I don't know why you still want me. I've been running from you all my life. But if you still do, here I am. I surrender. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I received my salvation. I was gloriously baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, then made preparations to shut my business down and go into full-time ministry. So that was 1969. And as I said, this last month, I began celebrating uh, entering into my 53rd year in the ministry. And I just want you to know, gentlemen, don't you ever get your wife interceding for you. 
because you ain't got a chance when your wife intercedes for you. You will straighten up, praise God. Amen, excuse me. So I want to share with you tonight, <clears throat> uh, Brother Copeland and I have been preaching together. I moved to Fort Worth to go to work with him, and that all came about by a prophetic word that he gave me uh, while I was still in Shreveport. He said that uh, he and I would be a team, and we'd spend the rest of our lives preaching together all over the world. And then when I moved to Fort Worth and went to work with him in 1970, uh, he'd only been in the ministry three years when, when I went to work with him, two years when I actually met him the year before. And uh, so he's three years ahead of me. And uh, in that three years, he had learned so much about the life of faith, particularly from Kenneth Hagin and working uh, in the flight department with Oral Roberts and going on all the crusades with Oral Roberts. And so he, he and Gloria were mine and Carolyn's first mentors in the Word of Faith. And so when we moved to, to Fort Worth to go to work with him, uh, back in those days, the, the crowds were small. Uh, we didn't go to churches because the, the term Word of Faith church didn't exist back then. And so a lot of the churches didn't want Brother Copeland because he was notorious for kicking over their sacred cows, okay? <laughs> and breaking tradition, you know. And so we didn't get many invitations from churches, so we had to go to a neutral site. And uh, so my job was to carry the little sound system he had. And, uh, you know, a, a, a crowd in those days may have been 100 people. And in the day service, he preached three services a day. And, and back then, we didn't go anywhere for a night. Everywhere we went, three weeks he said, he used to say, it takes a week to break through all the unbelief, the second week to get them to listen to what you have to say, and the third week we have a move of God, you know. And so we'd go out for three weeks, three services a day. And uh, so my job was to set up the auditorium or the, the meeting facility and uh, get it all ready for him. And then I would open the service and... and uh, make whatever announcements we needed to make about the meetings. And then when it was time for him to preach, I would say, uh, let's welcome Brother Copeland. And then he'd get up and he might sing a song. Back then his theme song was more, more about Jesus. And he sang it every, every meeting. And uh, uh, he might make a few announcements. And then he would turn to me. I'd be sitting on the platform, had the tape recorder there, it's real to real days. You remember that? And I'm, I'm got my headset on waiting for him to give me my cue to turn the recorder on. And it was always the same. Turn me on, Jerry. <laughs> so I'd turn it on, make sure I'm getting a good recording. I'd take the headset off and he knew everything's good. Then he'd start preaching. Okay. So I heard these words, three services a day for three weeks, Turn me on, Jerry. Turn me on, Jerry. Turn me on, Jerry. And I'd just like to announce, if it hadn't been for Jerry Savelle, Kenneth Copeland would have never got turned on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, those services was my Bible school. That was my seminary. Amen. And I... I, I uh, I took notes on every sermon he preached. And then not only that, but uh, we, people started uh, wanting a copy of the messages. And back then it was real to real. And so I would take a duplicator and set it up in my hotel room and I could only make one copy at a time on this duplicator. So if we got an order for three or four copies of that message that he preached, then I was up all night because if it was an hour and a half sermon, it took an hour and a half to duplicate. So I was up all night. And so every sermon he preached, I heard at least four times. Okay. And then over a period of time, uh, people began to order more. And so we finally got a duplicator that would, that would run off about four copies at a time. But even at that, uh, I'd, ha I'd, I'd listen to the sermon in the auditorium, 
and then I'd take it to my room and hear it all over again. Now the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Well, my faith was growing. I mean, it started growing almost immediately. And, uh, and not only that, but we're seeing results. And, and Brother Copeland and Gloria were our example. Okay, I listened to what he preached. I saw him act on it. I saw what he did. I saw what he did when things weren't going well. I saw what he did when everything was going well. I saw what he did when things looked impossible. I saw what he did when he had needs. And, and I just, the Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we just did what they did based on what we learned from them. And it began working for us just like it worked for them. Amen. So uh, Brother Copeland became, uh, you know, I, I grew up having heroes. And Brother Copeland became my faith hero. And to this day, he's still my faith hero, praise God. Love him, love him dearly. And we're not only co-laborers in the, in, the, in the Word of God and the Gospel, but we're very close friends. We're covenant partners. Our families are covenant in re covenant relationship. His children uh, consider me their second father. My, my daughters consider Brother Copeland their second father. My grandchildren, my first grandchild, he couldn't say Copeland, so he called him Brother Coco. <laughs> and to this day, when, when I see Brother Copeland, he says, uh, where's Mark James? He's, I said, oh, he's doing this and so. He said, well, tell him Brother Coco said hi, you know. <laughs> and he, he was there for all the birth of our children, uh, not our children, but all our grandchildren. I've been there when his kids were giving birth to their children. And we, we've been in close relationship all these years go on vacations together. And, and the whole time we're on vacation, it's just, we have fun. We have a lot of laughs, but it's just preaching, 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 preaching. Amen. In fact, I remember one time uh, we, were, we were at ORU and uh, both of us were on Brother Robert's board and uh, we were there for a meeting. And we flew in to Tulsa and got in the hotel just down the road from ORU. And uh, we got in late that night. He said, let's have breakfast in the morning. I said, okay. So we got up and had breakfast. We hadn't seen each other in about two months because both of us were traveling all over the place. And he said, let's have breakfast in the morning. I said, okay. So we got up to have breakfast and, and the waitress came by and we were talking. No, I'll take that back. Kenneth Copeland was talking. <laughs> Jerry was listening, okay. And he had just got this fresh revelation and, and hadn't had time to, uh, an opportunity to share it with anybody. So I became his sounding board. He said, now here, listen to this. What the Lord said to me last night, I can hardly wait to, to have breakfast with you this morning to share it with you. And boy, he just, he just was like rapid fire out of a machine gun, you know. And the waitress came back three or four times. You read the order? No, not yet. And so he just kept on. And then another preacher, if I gave his name, you'd know it, but I won't do that. Another preacher uh, saw us and he, he said, can I join you guys? Said, yeah, sure. Now, Brother Cope had been preaching to me for an hour already. We hadn't had even ordered breakfast yet. Waitress keeps coming back three or four times, you know. And he sat down and uh, uh, we shook hands with him and greeted him. And, and uh, he said, called the preacher by his first name. He said, I want to share something with you. And I thought, fresh meat. <laughs> and he started in all over again. I mean, he went through that whole thing. So I've heard it twice now. Okay. And, and the man, the waitress came up, he ordered breakfast. And he ate his breakfast while Brother Cope was still preaching to him. And then when he got through, he said, well, guys, I got to go. See you later. And, and then Brother Cope said, before you leave, do you understand what I'm telling you? He said, Kenneth, last thing I understood was when you said hello. <laughs> and he walked out. He said, now isn't that something? He said, did you understand what? I said, yeah, I understood every word. In fact, I'm going to preach it. And you better hurry up and do it before I do. Amen. But that's, that's our vacations. Preaching to one another. Amen. 
and we've had we've had great fun, great relationship, and and uh, it's such an honor to to this day. I still preach in all of his victory campaigns, and it's such an honor to know the man, and to li- and to, and to have the opportunity, as I've had for 52 of my 53 years, to watch him up close. I had that opportunity with Brother Hagen. I had that opportunity with T.L. Osborne and with Oral Roberts. And uh, what, a, what an honor it has been to have these men as mentors. I said last night, I'm so glad I lived in their generation and I heard their messages because it built the foundation that I live on today. And I might add, praise God, it's made a winner in life out of me. Hallelujah. And I give them, I, I give God through them all the, all the honor. Amen. So with all that in mind, I want to read a, a prophetic word that the Lord gave me on January the 20th. January the 20th. And uh, I want you to listen to it real close. If I can get these glasses open. 2022 will be marked by more and more exposure to corruption, evil agendas, lies, and cover-ups. Well, that's come to pass, hasn't it? It will be known as the year of the great unveiling of truth, not only regarding things that are taking place in your nation, but also a great unveiling of truth from God's Word that will cause you to rise above what is happening around you. Greater victories are on the horizon for those who will continue to put God's Word first place in their lives and refuse to compromise. 2022 will also be known as a year of great deliverance. What the adversary tried to do to hold you down and hold you back, God will reverse it and turn it around for your good. Remember that your God is the faithful God, and He's always working behind the scenes. So stay in faith, keep on rejoicing, because your best days are not behind you. Your best days are just ahead of you, praise God. So let's do what it said. Just lift our hands and begin to rejoice. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Even in the midst of what the rest of the world is saying, worst of times, the body of Christ can have their best of times. And I testify that's exactly what's happening to me, praise God. In fact, since March of 2020, when all this hit, I have never had better years in the history of my ministry than I've had since 2020 and right on up to this moment, praise God. It has been absolutely amazing. In fact, there's so many things happening so rapidly, I hardly don't even want to go to sleep at night because I don't want to miss anything. You know? Anybody else feel that way? Oh man, it's just been amazing. Now, I know not everybody can say that, but it's not over. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not over yet. Look at the other neighbor and say, hang in there, praise God. Amen. Now, the Lord also said to me, in fact, he said this to me in October the 1st of 2021. And he said, tell the people everywhere you go in 2022 to begin expecting to see the open hand of God. And Eric mentioned that, that every time I prayed, I kept seeing the hand of God come out of heaven. Amen. And he said, tell the people everywhere you go that if they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is happening around them, then I will open my hand and I will cause them to experience supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, that's exactly what I've been experiencing. I mean, from the moment he gave me that word on October the 1st, 2021, that's exactly what's been happening to me. It's been happening to our ministry. It's been been happening to thousands of people all over the world that have already heard me preach it. And we're we're not even through March yet. Amen. Amen. But, you know, through social media, you can reach the whole world from your house now. I mean, I don't, I don't have to travel the world anymore. I can, I can reach the whole world from my TV studios right there in Crowley, Texas. And if you don't know where Crowley is, it's a suburb of Fort Worth. But I don't have to go to the world anymore. But I want to because, as I said last night, in 69, I heard, go ye, and I heard, hadn't heard, stop ye yet. Hallelujah. 
So, but, but the, the message is already reaching the world before I ever get out there. Amen. And we have testimonies that are coming in from people all over the world that are experiencing the open hand of God. Supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. Amen. And I think you ought to lift your hands right now and say, I receive that. And why don't you go ahead and praise God in advance. Hallelujah. Amen. Did, did my mic go off? I said, did you, would you praise God in advance? Is that the best you can do? Come on, praise God in advance. <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. I learned a long time ago that one of the greatest expressions of faith is being able to praise God in advance before you ever see anything happen. So let's try that one more time. Let's praise God in advance. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. All right. You can be seated if you can. Now, another thing the Lord said to me, and this, this came on November the 28th, of 2021. <clears throat> In addition to it being a year of the open hand of God, he said it'll also be a year of divine acceleration and unstoppable momentum. Amen. Divine acceleration yeah. and unstoppable momentum. Yes, now, it's been said, and this didn't originate from me, I heard someone else say it, and uh, it, it's, it's exactly what I believe, and I can't improve on it, so I'm just going to borrow it. Right. And if I re could remember who I heard say it, I'd give them credit for it, but I don't remember who I heard say it. But the person saying this said these words, Divine acceleration is the supernatural ability of God to bring His plans, His purposes, and His will to pass at a much faster rate than is humanly possible. Amen. Divine acceleration. Now, how many of you remember the great revival that took place down in Brownwood, Florida? I believe it's Brownwood, Brownville. Yeah, Brownville, Florida. Before that broke loose, a man that God used that was instrumental in bringing that in. Now, he, he wasn't the preacher. I believe it was a, a gentleman by the name of Spring. Spring's last name was Spring. It was the man that God used in the revival. But the man who ushered it in ahead of him was a man named Dick Rubin. Yes. And Dick Rubin was a born-again Jewish man and became a very close friend of mine. And Dick Rubin, in preparing the people for that move of God that would take place shortly after he brought this series of messages. Dick Rubin taught that God is a God of patterns. And his theme was, when the pattern's right, the glory falls. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. And that was his theme. And then I had Dick come uh, to our Bible school and teach on that for several weeks. And, uh, uh, and him pointing out that, that there are patterns in the Bible. Now, I'm saying that for this reason. How many of you remember the very first miracle of Jesus? Turning water into wine. Okay, let's go look at that story for a moment in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Forgive me for, I don't normally wear glasses. I, I, I wear them if I've read a whole lot. My eyes are tired. My eyes are not tired, but I read a whole lot today. So I need to use these. Now let's look at verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. 
And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto him, or saith unto his servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto them, <clears throat> Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, notice here that the very first miracle that Jesus performed was a miracle of divine acceleration. Divine acceleration. I think that's very interesting. And God being a God of patterns, I have reason to believe that you and I are going to live to see God closing out this church age with how He started it, with divine acceleration. Divine acceleration. Amen. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that we no longer have to use our faith. What it does mean is it's not going to take as long to get results. I thought you'd be more excited about that, praise God. You know, I, I, I say this often. Some of you have probably heard me say it. Um, <clears throat> I, when I first came to the Lord, the very first scripture I read, now as Brother Copeland is famous for saying, I, like him, was scripturally, scripturally illiterate. I didn't know anything. And that turned out to be a blessing, praise God, because <laughs> I didn't have to unlearn anything, okay? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and so, uh, when I began to open the Bible for the very first time, now I remember as a young boy, as a kid, uh, I'd, I'd get my mama's great big Bible, and it had pictures in it. And I'd look at the pictures, but, but I didn't read much of it. And I'd heard all my young life, John 3, 16, okay? But for me, for the first time, to actually look in the Bible and see what it said, and then with a decision to act upon it or live by it, that didn't happen until shortly after I came to the Lord in February of 1969. So the first scripture I read Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that little word, continue, jumped out of the pages and into my heart. And the Lord said to me, This is the missing ingredient in your life. You've always been a great starter, but you, always, you haven't always been a great finisher. And He said, If you don't learn how to continue. And he said it this way. I, I had never heard this phrase quite that way before. He said, if you don't learn how to develop the art of continuing, then you'll never be the man I want you to be, never be the husband I want you to be, never be the father I want you to be, and certainly not the minister I want you to be. So learn to continue. Learn to stick with it. And then he said this, and make a decision right now while I'm talking to you that quitting is no longer an option. <laughs> quitting is no longer an option. And if you knew me well, you know that quitting is not an option in my life. And so I have said many times, 
after I found out where Paul said in Ephesians, having done all to stand, stand therefore. I've said many times, my name is Jerry, having done all to stand, stand, Savell. That's my middle name, okay? <laughs> having done all to stand, stand, Savell. I am a master in the art of standing. <laughs> I've learned how to stand. And there have been times I've stood for 20 years on something that God promised me and 20 years before it came to pass. But I would not waver, I would not give up, I would not quit, and I wouldn't let anybody talk me out of it. Amen. Amen. And I'm so glad I did. So, continue. So that, that became a quest for me. Develop the art of continuing. So I learned uh, from Kenneth Hagin many years ago. He used to say, and I'm sure you heard him say it, if you are prepared to stand forever, then it won't take very long. But most Christians are not prepared to stand forever. Most Christians are prepared to stand until, until dark or, or until next week. Or maybe they'll stand a month. But prepare to stand forever? Now he did not say, Kenneth Hagin didn't say that every faith project takes forever. He just said, if you will be prepared to stand forever, then it won't take very long. And I got that in me. So I said, Lord, in fact, the moment I heard Kenneth Hagin say it, when I got back to my room, I stood in, 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 in front of the mirror and I said to the Lord, Lord, you are looking at a young man that is prepared to stand forever, if that's how long it takes. Then I pointed to myself and I said, Jerry Savelle, you will be prepared to stand forever if that's how long it takes and quitting's not an option in your life. Yes, Amen. Yes, and I have lived up to that for almost 53 years now. So I know how to stand. I know how to stand. I said, I know how to stand. And I've watched God come through time and time again. In fact, my testimony is he had never disappointed me, never let me down. I don't know one thing about unanswered prayer. God has done what he said he would do. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But he taught me the importance of continuing. You know, that is almost a lost art in the world today and in the body of Christ. We got a lot of quitters. Don't shout me down now. <laughs> as Brother Hagin would say when I'm preaching real good. <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, I, I, I've watched over the years preachers come and go. I've watched churches start and shut down. I've watched Christians come and go. And oh, Lord, have I watched Christians change churches. If every believer and, I, and I'm not picking on your church because this is true all over the world. If every person who ever came to this church and said to you in some form or another, Pastor, I don't know what I'd do if I hadn't come here. I don't know where our family would be today if I hadn't come here. And usually that's about the last time you see them. I've said occasionally, uh, I don't want any of my church members telling me I love you. That's the last time I see them. Amen. Amen. I, 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 I just say, uh, I know, don't say it. <laughs> Isn't that true? Tony's been with me 23 years and he ain't going nowhere. <clears throat> he may be big, but I can tap on a stool. <clears throat> and he's, his mother gave me permission to whip him anytime he needs it. <laughs> Amen. And, and he's been with me 23 years now. And he has seen the number of people that have, you know, Brother Jerry, oh, Brother Jerry, what would he have done if God hadn't sent us to you? If we hadn't got a hold of your message, oh, we thank God for you. And where are they? So what I'm saying is, if every one of those people who said something to that effect to you were still here, this building wouldn't hold them. 
And it's that way all over the world. That's right. That's right. Where are they? Well, we stay home and watch television, church on television. I can't find in the Bible where that is appropriate. <laughs> Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Amen. Now, we appreciate people, you know, watching us on TV, but I don't want them doing it on Sunday morning when they ought to be in church. Record it and watch it after church. And I'll drink to that. And just to clarify, because you have to clarify everything these days, this is not Texas homebrew. It's honey and water, and it helps soothe my throat, praise God. Okay, so now that we got that clear, and nobody go home and say, we don't know what Savelle was drinking in the service. But boy, every time he took a sip, boy, the fire got coming. <laughs> Amen. So, by and large, the world knows nothing about continuing in anything. And it's, it is sad that so many people in the body of Christ don't know anything about continuing. So, where do people go to find examples and people they can follow after? that just won't quit. Amen. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where God blesses quitters. He blesses people that persevere. He blesses people that, that stick with it. He blesses people that won't compromise. He blesses people that, that are here for the long haul. Hallelujah. I've had people say, Brother Jerry, I've been tithing for about three months now. Am I faithful? No, not yet. <laughs> anybody can do something for three months. Well, almost anybody. <laughs> three months doesn't prove anything. That's a good start. Amen. I mean, what if I went to my wife and I said, Carolyn, I've been faithful for three months now. She'd probably say, and? <laughs> no, I've been faithful to her for 55 and a half years. I'm, 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 I'm glad I can be able to say to my wife, and she doesn't travel with me all the time, you know? And a lot of times I've traveled all over the world all by myself. I'd have people in, in our offices in other nations that would be there to join me when I traveled the the other parts of the world that I was in. But a lot of times my wife's not with me. And she trusts me. Because she knows there's never been another. I'm not, I'm not looking for another. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't say to care about Carolyn like Adam said about Eve. That woman you gave me. And I say, ooh, that woman you gave me. Hallelujah. <laughs> I tell her all the time. Now, we've known each other since I was 11 and she was 9. Grew up on the same street. Now, we didn't start dating until her senior year in high school, and I'd already been out of high school for two years. And, uh, and I'd tell her, in fact, when I left the house yesterday, I kissed her goodbye, said, I'll see you Monday. And then I turned around and said, and you're still my girlfriend. <laughs> oh, Amen. So I'm not looking for another. But to me, faithfulness is not measured over two or three weeks. It's measured over a lifetime. Amen. And the reason so many of God's people are not enjoying greater manifestations of the blessing of God, the favor of God, the miracles of God, is because they don't make the decision that quitting is not an option. Amen. And particularly in times like these. Man, this is where you need to dig in. I mean, drive your stake in the ground and tell the devil if anybody quits, it's going to be you and not me. Amen. 
Hallelujah. So notice here that in this story where Jesus turned the water into wine, it was a miracle of divine acceleration. Divine acceleration. Now, I have some friends out in California where vineyards are, you know, the thing in that particular area. And, and some of my friends, when they were young men, uh, pastor friends, when they were young men, they, they worked in those vineyards. And so I asked them, I said, well, how long does it take from the time you plant the seed for it to actually become wine? Okay. So normally it takes at least three years after you plant the seed and the, and the grape begins to form and then uh, it begins to ripen and it's ready for harvesting. That's, that's usually about three years. Then they say that normally you don't start serving it as wine for another three years. So they say from the time that you plant the seed and you start serving it as wine could be anywhere from eight to nine years. Okay. So what Jesus did was divine acceleration. Do you realize that when those disciples started pouring the water into the water pots, by the time it hit the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, it became wine. A nine-year process, possibly, in a moment. Now don't tell me the God I serve can't turn around something. Amen? I mean, I'd, be, I'd love to be able to tell you that everything I've ever prayed for, the moment I said amen, there it was. But that's not the case. I've had to stand. Now I have had uh, a few times where almost before I could get the amen out, it was already happening. But most of the time, it was a process. And, and sometimes, as I said, it has taken as much as 20 years. I don't think I've ever had to stand over 20 years, but there have been some things that I stood in faith for for 20 years before they came to pass. But what I'm, what I'm hearing the Lord say is this. Since I am a God of patterns and I started the ministry of Jesus with divine acceleration, why can't I end this church age with divine acceleration? Anybody think that way? Praise God. Like T.D. Jake says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen. Hallelujah. God is speeding up the process. Now, once again, that doesn't mean, oh, we can throw our spiritual armor in the corner now because everything's going to happen immediately. No. That means you still have to walk by faith. That still means you can't be moved by what you see. Still means you can't be moved by what you hear. Still means you can't be moved by what you feel. It still means having done all to stand, stand. But the standing is not going to take as long. Hallelujah. Because God is speeding up the process. Come on, give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Amen. Now, let me give you an example. Years ago, now I worked as Brother Copeland's associate minister from 1970 until the end of 1973. And then I launched out into this ministry. And, and as I said, we're still a team, even though we have two separate ministries. We still preach together all over the world and will till Jesus comes. Brother Copeland's saying all over the world he's going to live to be 120. He's exactly 10 years older than me. But we were both born in December. And now he's saying that Jerry's going to live to be 110 because when I leave, there's no need him sticking around. Praise <laughs> God. He's going with me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so so uh, we've been preaching together all these years. And there have been a lot of things 
over the years where he has prophesied over me and things that he said in the natural at the time he said it looked utterly impossible. How in the world would that ever come to pass for me? Okay. But because I trust his ability to hear the voice of God, just like I did Brother Hagin's, Every, everything Brother Hagin ever prophesied over me, over me came to pass. Not overnight, but it came to pass. And the same with Brother Copeland. And, and sometimes it would be so far out there that your mind, your natural mind couldn't grasp it. But my spirit did. And I would, I would ask the, his people that work with him, did you guys record that? Yes, we did. I said, give me a copy of it. And then I'd take it to my secretary and have her transcribe it. And then my art department would put it in some beautiful lettering and frame it and put it in my office. So every time I was home, I could walk up there and read that. And the moment after the, the moment I would read the last line in that, I would lift my right hand and I'd say, I receive that in faith in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Now my head's still thinking, how could this ever be? But my spirit grabbed hold of it. And my faith grabbed hold of it. Amen. And one, one of the things that he said to me in 1981 in Philadelphia, October of 1981, uh, I was not uh, scheduled to be with him. I'd just finished a meeting with him in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Carol and I were going home to, to rest. We'd been in that convention for a week. Brother Copeland and Gloria were leaving the next week for Philadelphia. I said, Carolyn, I just feel like we need to be in that meeting. So I called Brother Copeland. I said, uh, we're going we're to be in your meeting in, in Philadelphia. He said, well, there's no need in both of us flying our airplanes. Why don't you, you and Carolyn just fly with Gloria and I? So we flew up there with them. And Brother Copeland said, now, I'll, uh, I'll open it uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night. And then you preach Friday morning, and then I'll, I'll finish out the meeting. I said, no, I didn't come to preach. I came to just receive. And he said, you're not going to go with me and not preach. <laughs> I said, Brother Copeland, I didn't, I didn't come to preach. I just, I just, I just came, Carolyn, I just wanted to come. I felt like I'm supposed to be here. And, and, and some, God has something for me to receive. He said, yes, and he wants you to preach the morning service as well. <laughs> so, you know, who am I to argue with Kenneth Copeland, you know? So I preached that morning service. It was a powerful service. And I was about to walk off the platform and go join Carolyn and Gloria on the front row. And Brother Copeland was coming up because I'd turned the service to him. And he said, wait a minute, Jerry, the word of the Lord's come to me. So I turned around and he began to prophesy. And it was quite lengthy. And one of the things he said was, God is about to hand over to you some exceeding valuable land. And he said, went on to talk about some things, and, and, uh, and I won't go into all of that. And he added, and he's going to make you a modern day New Testament Abraham. Now, that, that's pretty far out there, okay? So your mind would have trouble grasping that, <clears throat> but your spirit can receive it, okay? So he went on and on and some other things. So I had that transcribed and put it on, on the wall in a frame in, in my office. So every time I was home, I'd read that, and then I'd lift my hand and I'd say, I receive that in faith. Well, that didn't happen immediately. Didn't happen in a year. Didn't happen in three or four years. Years down the road, uh, the Lord impressed upon me to begin to buy up all the land that I could get my hands on right around where our ministry was. Okay. And it was all, uh, my home was out there. It was rural land, undeveloped. My closest neighbors back when I first started building out there were five to seven miles away. And, and I'm a country boy and I like my space. So <clears throat> I had horses and cattle and everything, you know. And, and uh, so over a period of time, I started acquiring 
land, maybe five acres here, 10 acres there, 20 acres here. And then there was 102 acres right across the road from my house and our ministry headquarters. And I'm on my horse riding on that land and I don't know who owns it. It's not posted, it's not fenced. So I would ride my horse over there. And uh, one day as I was riding my horse, the Lord said, if you will be patient, I will arrange for you to have all this land you want and pay whatever you want to pay for it. I said, then consider me patient right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, patience, the Bible definition of patience doesn't mean just put up with it and hope to God it'll be better in heaven. No, patience means non-wavering, non-compromising. Okay? And so I said, consider me patient now. The next week, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, our local newspaper, came out with an article where a corporation had bought that 102 acres and they put in the paper what they were planning to build on it. I held the newspaper up. I said, God, did you read the paper this morning? <laughs> Somebody bought my land. And he said, whose report will you believe? He said, throw that in the trash where it belongs. Didn't I tell you to be patient? I said, yes, sir. Consider me patient. I watched that corporation. I didn't pray this on them. I didn't have to pray anything. I just held to what God said. I watched that corporation go bankrupt. I watched two other corporations come in there and buy my land, and they too went bankrupt. And then one day, the RTC, which is a government agency, called our office and said, we have repossessed this land, and our superiors have told us, get rid of it. We don't want the land. We want it off the books. And they said, call Dr. Savell and tell him to make us an offer. Okay. And then they said, now tell him there's a $1.2 million lien against it. <clears throat> so he's going to have to surpass that amount before we'll even talk to him about, you know, uh, purchasing it. So <clears throat> uh, when they told me about that, I, I didn't take the call, but they told me about it. My general manager and I said, Lord, you said that I, would, I could have all that land I wanted and pay whatever I wanted to pay for it. He said, I did. I said, well, I don't even want to pay the $1.2 million lien. He said, well, what do you want to pay? I said, I'll give them $200,000 cash. I want the lien removed. I want the mineral rights. And I want a clear title. He said, then tell them. So I called my attorney, who was a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, miracle-working attorney. <laughs> Got saved under my ministry 40 years ago. Been with me all these years. In fact, I talked to him today. He was working miracles. Hallelujah. And uh, uh, I said, Wayne, call the RTC and gave him this number. And he called him, and his opening statement was this. Is anybody up there, is there anybody up there that believes in miracles? Okay. They said, no, we work for the government. We don't see miracles. <clears throat> he said, well, my client believes in miracles. I believe in miracles. And here's his offer. Your superior said, have him make an offer. Here's his offer. He'll give you $200,000 cash. He wants the lien removed. He wants a clear title. He wants the mineral rights. And there was total silence. He said, is anybody still there? They said, yes, but that's so ridiculous, we're not even going to make the offer. He said, no, you are. Your superiors told you to call Mr. Savell and have him make an offer. Here's our offer. I'll expect a call from you before the evening is over. They called him back. Now, I'm in, I'm in uh, New York with Jesse and Kathy Duplantis and my wife, and Wayne calls me in New York. And he said... Uh, I called him, told him what you said, and uh, I just got off the phone with him, and their opening remarks were, we now believe in miracles. <laughs> so, amen. Hallelujah. So I got 102 acres of, of rural property, <clears throat> undeveloped, $1.2 million lien removed, clear title, got the mineral rights, paid cash for it, $200,000. And a few years later, 
they found gas on the property. And my first royalty check was $3 million. Hallelujah. Now, when I say Brother Copeland prophesies like E.F. Hutton, they got my attention, you know. <laughs> when Brother Copeland prophesies over me, wouldn't you call that exceeding valuable land? Hey, not only that, I sold a portion of it. I've, I've kept 45 acres to build our new uh, a church campus on, which we are beginning now, and, and sold off all the rest of it. And that generated enough money well, we're going to pay cash for our new building, praise God, our new campus, hallelujah. Exceeding great land, valuable land. Amen. Now, that, that took several years to come to pass, but it came to pass. Amen. And then I, I had said in the early days when I left Brother Copeland's office, or as a full-time employee and began my own ministry and, and began hiring people and work in the ministry. I started telling them then. Now back then, you know, offerings, they were small and we're, we're getting established. And uh, offerings were small and then they began to grow and so forth. And I began saying, when we, when we had not yet even received a $1,000 offering all at one time, and there'd been some people that gave over a period of time, and if you totaled it up, it'd be over a thousand. But before anybody had ever invested a thousand dollars all at one time in my ministry, I was telling our handful of staff. Now we have staff all over the world now, but this handful of staff, I was telling them, one day, somebody's going to put a million dollars all at one time in our ministry. And they all began to say, and I'm, it was almost like a competitive thing, and I'm going to be the one who opens the envelope with a million dollar check in it. Mm -hmm. Now, as we grew, and we hired more people, and, you know, we got a whole accounting department and a whole uh, partner services department, and now all of them in there, they got in with that, and, and it's mostly ladies in there, and they were all saying, I'm going to be the one who opens that envelope with that first million dollar check in it. Well, one day I got a call from, I just, I just arriving back home, I got a call from a man. He said, Jerry, can you come to my office today? Are you in town? I said, I just got in town. He said, can you come to my office today? I said, well, I'm not sure where your office is. He said, well, it's the same office dad had, and you and dad were friends, and dad thought the world of you. And he said, uh, when dad passed away, I took over the business. And he said, uh, and it's in the same place where dad had his office. I said, okay, I know where it is. He said, come over. My wife and I want to talk to you. So I drove over there and he began to give me his testimony. He said, when dad passed away, none of the family knew how much trouble our business was in. We were on the verge of losing everything. And he said, and, and now I'm responsible, you know, to take it over and to try to resurrect it. And he said, no, nah, man, in the natural, it looked impossible. But I, I found your book called From Devastation to Restoration. And he said, and I began reading it. And I've read it three times now. And I told my wife, when God turns this around, we're going to bless Brother Jerry's ministry big time. And so I'm sitting there listening to this. And he said, and God turned it around big time. And then he pushed an envelope. Now, he's a, he, he, he was a big, tall Texan, over six foot four, you know, weighed about 260, wore cowboy boots all the time, cowboy hat. And I'm sitting in front of his desk. And he's sitting in his chair with his feet, with them cowboy boots propped on the desk. And boots look like, look like they're that tall. You know, it must have been a size 13 or something. And he takes his foot and pushes an envelope over to me. He said, open that, Jerry. So I, I open it, and his wife was sitting there. And I open it, and it was a check for $1 million. Okay? Now, I felt led of the Lord to call an immediate staff meeting, you know. <laughs> So I, I called Joe and I said, Joe, tell everybody 
be in the, in the, uh, prepared for a staff meeting when I get there. I'll be there in about 20 minutes. So everybody's in there. I said, ladies, I know all of you have been confessing that you're going to be the one who opens the envelope. Na 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 na. <laughs> Look what I just opened. Oh man, a million dollars. I said, come and look at it because I want you to get used to seeing this. Amen. Get used to seeing this. Now that first million dollar check took about 30 years to manifest. Now there had been people that had given over a million dollars over a period of time, over years. You know, one, one gentleman uh, had given $1.2 million over a period of a number of years, you know. And, uh, but that took about 30 some odd years, okay. Now when the Lord gave me this word, starting on October the 1st, 2021, about I will open my hand and divine or, or supernatural, extraordinary, unusual provision will come to those who will not be shaken by all the chaos and disorder that's happening around them. About two to three weeks after I received that word, and then just before, I, th I think it was right around the same time, I had received the word about divine acceleration and unstoppable momentum. In the mail. From October the 1st until Three weeks later, a million dollars came in. One envelope, one check for a million dollars. What used to take 30 some odd years came to pass in less than a month. I'd call that divine acceleration. Amen. Wouldn't you call that a divine acceleration? And, and I, 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 uh, when it came through the man, it wasn't a member of our church. It's, it's some partners that have been partners with me for years. And I called them to, to tell them I received it and thanked them and prayed over them. And they said, Brother Jerry, the first time we heard you many years ago, we couldn't even afford being a $10 a month partner with your ministry. But we, we got your messages and we read your books and we stuck with it. And today we were able to sow a million dollars into your ministry. Praise God. Amen. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? I was as thrilled for them as I was for myself. Praise God. Now, I, I walked into the office and, and showed Eric and Joe and a couple of them. I said, uh, we got a million dollar check in the mail today. And then I turned around and went to my office. And Eric said, he just act like it's happening every day. I wanted to tell him, I didn't know about it until later. I said, just keep on confessing that. Hallelujah. I'll get in agreement with it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Now, I'm not promising everybody a million dollars. But I do know God, and I do. I know He's He honors His word. Amen. See, God doing that for me, I I consider it confirming the word with signs following. So when I preach this, it gives validity to the message, because it's happening, and not only to me, but happening to people all over the world. We're getting some tremendous testimonies of financial breakthroughs that people have been. <coughs> excuse. <laughs> believing for, for many years that are suddenly happening, praise God. In fact, that's one of my favorite words in the Bible. Suddenly. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I love those suddenlies. Hallelujah. All right, now, very quickly. <clears throat> everybody still with me? Very quickly. Let me, let me share this with you. I think it's very interesting. Let me find it. Help me with that, Lord. Where is it? Okay. Let, let's look at Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. <clears throat> I wrote this down this afternoon. Breakthroughs and miracles are going to happen and be on the increase 
and your responsibility would be to keep up with it all. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I take on that responsibility. How about you? I got any volunteers to take on that responsibility? Amen. Now, I wrote this down. Momentum, a, a, a definition for momentum, a moving force that overcomes all resistance. A moving force that overcomes all resistance. Amen. It's never God's will that we live a defeated lifestyle. His best that we win, not just occasionally, but all the time. 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks unto God, be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always. Amen. And then I wrote this down. Don't focus on all the negative circumstances that are surrounding you. Once you learn how to stop this and learn how to win, then you'll begin to pick up momentum and it will have a domino effect. You stack up dominoes and push one and they'll just fall as long as that. It's one victory fast on the heels of another. That's what I wrote down. One victory fast on the heels of another. Now, Genesis, well, I gotta, I gotta look at this other verse first before we go there. You go ahead and find Genesis 26. Forgive me for not having that marked already. I got lots of notes since October the 1st on this subject. <laughs> Can't preach it all in one service. Okay, I'll get there. I'll get there. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Hallelujah. Aha. Now this this is a this is a definition of divine acceleration and unstoppable momentum. Most of you are familiar with Amos chapter nine and verse thirteen. Now here's how it reads in the King James. Then I'm going to read another translation. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. Okay? Now, the message translation reads this way. Yes, indeed. It won't be long now. Things are going to happen so fast that your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once. And everywhere you look, blessings, blessings, blessings. Hallelujah. That's... That's divine acceleration. Hallelujah. Amen. Now we'll look at Genesis chapter 23 or 26. Praise God. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. <clears throat> Verse 1 And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that were in the days of Abraham. <coughs> Verse 2 says, And the Lord appeared unto him, Isaac, and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall show thee of. <coughs> Excuse me. It's like I got a feather in my throat. <coughs> now, not going to Egypt is symbolic of don't look to the world as your source. Amen. Amen. Don't look to the world <coughs> as your source. Sojourn in the land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee. 
So notice he says, don't look to the world as your source. I'll be with you and I will bless you, which means I will empower you to prosper through it all. Even though there's a famine, even though there's a pandemic, I will be with you. I will empower you to prosper. Hallelujah. Aren't you the seed of Abraham? Heirs according to the promise? Then this is good for you as much as it was for Isaac. Hallelujah. So what is God promising? I will be with you. Don't look to the world as your source. I'll bless you. I'll empower you to prosper. I'll cause you to excel. I'll cause you to rise above everything that's happening around you. Amen. And it says, and Isaac dwelt in that land. And in verse 6, and Isaac sowed. Or he, he dwelled in the land of Jorah. And in verse 12, and then Isaac sowed in that land. And received in the same year. In the same year. In the same year. Same year. Let's see, this is March. Got nine months to the end of the year. Does anybody in here believe that God could turn every situation in your life around in, the, in nine months? Does anybody in here believe that God could get you totally debt free within nine months? <clears throat> What's nine months to God? In fact, there are stories in the Bible where the prophet said, this time tomorrow. 24 hours later, everything changed. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We serve the God of divine acceleration. Amen. I'd like to say tonight, just like uh, the three Hebrew children said to Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar said to the three Hebrew children, who is that God that can deliver you? Come on now. Come on now. Well, that's the God we serve. Hallelujah. Amen. Who is that God that can turn everything around this time tomorrow or nine months from here? Hallelujah. Will anybody receive it? <clears throat> Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Now, we keep reading. He sowed in that land, received a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him, empowered him to prosper. And the man waxed great. Now, the Amplified Bible says it this way. He gained more and more until he became very wealthy and distinguished. Gained more and more. That's unstoppable momentum. He gained more and more. It just wouldn't stop. The message translation says he got richer and richer by the day until he became very wealthy. Richer and richer by the day. That's unstoppable momentum. Hallelujah. Will anybody receive it? Praise God. Amen. And if you read this chapter closely, you'll notice that his unstoppable momentum was a result of his obedience to God and staying focused on what God had said. And that's what it's going to cause divine acceleration and unstoppable momentum in your life during 2022. Be obedient to God and stay focused on what He said. Amen. Amen. Now, if all you do is you leave here tonight and you say, wasn't that a good little sermon that little preacher gave us? And that's the end of it. You never think about it again. You never, you never voice it out of your mouth. You never decree it. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. If all you do is just, you know, that good sermon, I'm glad I got to come. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, They didn't mix faith with the word preach, and therefore it didn't profit them. Amen. So is anybody going to mix faith with what you heard tonight? Say this with me. Lift both hands and say this with me. In the name of Jesus, 
I mix my faith with the word I heard preached tonight. And I believe this is my time to experience the open hand of God. And I will experience through his open hand, supernatural, unusual, and extraordinary provision. Not only that, this is my season for divine acceleration and unstoppable momentum. I'm a person of faith. I'll continue to use my faith, but I'm confident that what I'm believing for is not going to take near as long from this day forward as it has in the past. And I'm excited about it. I believe I'll just jump up and shout unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, let's shout unto God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen and amen. Now, now be seated for just a moment where everybody can see me back there. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Divine acceleration. Praise God. I wrote, I wrote something down just before I left the room. There it is. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 1, verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. The Passion Translation says that will empower you to stand strong in your faith. And then the Message Translation says, I so long to be there with you to deliver God's gift in person and watch you grow stronger right before my eyes. So this tells us that it is possible for someone in whom God has anointed or gifted or graced with special giftings to impart it into others. Amen. And in studying this, I've, I've discovered several ways in which an impartation can come. You remember, uh, God told Moses to lay his hands on Joshua and impart into him some of his honor, some of his wisdom. And, and Moses did. And the Bible confirms that it happened to Joshua. Amen. You remember, Elijah so told Elijah that if you see me when I go up, then your request will be granted. And that request was a double portion of Elijah's anointing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when the, Elijah went up and his mantle fell, yeah. Yeah. Elijah picked it up and began to test to see if he got that double portion. And he did. In fact, you can read in the Bible twice as many miracles recorded in Elijah's ministry as Elijah's ministry. So the impartation came from the dropping of that mantle and him picking it up yes, yes, sir. and saying, where is the God of Elijah? Yeah. Amen. And then there's the laying on of hands. The Apostle Paul said uh, to Timothy, his son Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is in you that came to you by the laying on of my hands. So an impartation came when Paul laid his hands on Timothy. There's also in the book of Acts where uh, the elders of the church were about to uh, separate Saul and Barnabas to the ministry that they were called to. And, and an impartation came into them through prayer and fasting and the laying on of hands. Okay, So there's various ways that impartations can come. I've, I've received impartations from all these four men that were mentioned earlier, from Brother Copeland, from Brother Hagan, Brother Roberts, Brother T.L. Osborne. And, and everywhere I go, I not only have my own gift from God, 
but I carry a portion of their giftings in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In fact, everybody I lay hands on, they have the benefit of five people. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I, I take this very seriously. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> and then there's also uh, an impartation that can come through clothing and cloth. Aprons, the Bible says in the book of Acts, were taken from the body of Paul. And whomever they were laid upon, their diseases were healed. And demons, if, if they had any demonic uh, oppression or whatever, demons fled. Why? Because that cloth became a conduit for the anointing that was on Paul. So these are some of the various ways that, that uh, an impartation can come. Now, the Lord impressed upon me uh, right after He gave me these words that everywhere I go in 2022, and, and I'm not saying it'll stop then, but at least everywhere I go in 2022, He said, carry prayer cloths with you. Put them in your pocket. Wear them while you preach. The anointing that's on you while you preach will come in those prayer cloths. And he, and he gives me a specific thing for the people to believe for. And this is just a point of contact. There's no virtue in these cloths. Amen. But when they come from the body of someone who's gifted and anointed, and, I, and I'm not bragging on me, I give all the glory to God because without Christ, I'm nothing. Okay. But I do know there's an anointing on my life. And I do know that I have giftings from God. Amen. And so the Lord impressed upon me today that those of you that would like one of these prayer cloths. Now, I may not have as many as our people in the building right now, but I've prayed over all of them. And they're in, there's some more in my briefcase because the Lord said, take them everywhere you go. And we're getting tremendous testimonies from this. We just, we just heard of a man just a couple of days ago. He was dying of four-stage cancer. And his wife took one of these prayer cloths, and he's been given a clean bill of health. And this is just a few days ago, praise God. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> we're, we're having financial miracles reported, Amen. breakthroughs reported. Amen. So as I close tonight, and before I turn the service back to Pastor Jay, uh, I'm just going to lay these on the platform, and I'd, I'd appreciate it. And in honor of everybody here, because there may be several that would like to have them, just take one. And then if we run out, as I said, I've already prayed over a bunch more that are in, the, in my Bible case, and we'll set out some more. But here's another thing that's important. When the turnaround comes, when the breakthrough comes, and I didn't say if, when the turnaround comes, when the breakthrough comes, when the hand of God is manifested, Hallelujah. When divine acceleration takes place, when unstoppable momentum takes place, I need the testimony. Amen. So that it will inspire other people all over the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So stand to your feet. Guys, you might want to move that, all this out of the way. Let me get up here where I can see you and pray over you. <clears throat> Excuse me for struggling with my voice tonight, but I've been preaching a lot. You should try to do this sometime. <laughs> Amen. Lift your hands up. In fact, lift your hands up and point them toward these prayer cloths. Father, in the name of Jesus, in obedience to you, I have carried these cloths with me tonight as I preached. And I believe the anointing that was on me is in these cloths, their conduits for that anointing to be released in others. And you placed on my heart specifically for them to believe as they take these prayer cloths, for the hand of God to be opened unto them, for supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision, for divine acceleration and unstoppable momentum. That's what we are believing for. In the name of Jesus. And just like the little woman 
who said, If I but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. We are believing that the moment we touch these clothes, the miracle working power of God goes into action right then, praise God. And we thank you in advance for the miracles and the testimonies that shall come because of this tonight. And we thank you for it. Amen and amen. amen. Give the Lord another shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.